Good morning, here I am again for another lovely session of CENG Concrete Design. This is going to be lecture in the video series, and this I'll be recording part one this morning, and part there'll be later parts of this all recorded today and tomorrow. Lovely. So uh, uh, we have finished covering what I want to cover in this course relating to uh, bolt design, and what I next want to move on to is the design of welds. Uh, so let's consider weldment strength. So the overall design of a weld. Now, uh, as we discussed previously, there are two main ways of uh, joining together steel members and modern steel structures. One are, of course, high strength bolts, and the other are uh, welds. I mean, in a previous video, we discussed the benefits and drawbacks of each as a uh, fastening or joining system. Um, so uh, weldment strength is really ultimately de determined by one of two things. Uh, depends on one of two things. Uh, one, the base metal, or I should say one, the weld metal itself. And so in general terms, I could call this uh, phi, FW, uh, AW. Where phi would be your resistance factor, FW would be your stress, uh, design stress in your uh, base metal, and AW would be the area of the weld. Or two, the uh, ba or sorry, this would be the weld metal. Sorry, V would be the uh, resistance factor. FW would be the uh, the stress in the weld, and AW would be the area of the weld. Uh, two or the base metal, where the allowable stress or the design stress, I should say, would be phi FBM times ABM where phi is your resistance factor, FBM is your stress, and ABM is the uh, area of the base metal. And the, all of these things, um, both strengths are a function of, of a few things. Uh, both, uh, both of these strengths are a function of the weld type and the orientation of the weld. of weld type and the orientation of the weld. And an orientation of the weld. Okay. And so uh, our guide here for this is going to be based on, let's see if we get our table number. This is going to be table uh, J2.5. Uh, table J2.5, and in the AISC 15th edition, this is on page 16.1-123. Uh, in AISC 15th. In the AISC 15th edition. And if you turn to there, so I would encourage you if you can to turn to there, uh, and you'll see that we have, depending on the type of weld, um, we have a whole different variation in um, fee factors. And so the feed factors and the, the, the feed factors, the resistance factors. Um, so again, this table defines resistance factors for weld type and weld orientation. For weld type and weld orientation. Now it doesn't give you the exact uh, stresses. You need to you'll you'll need to use other tables and other values in order to get the actual um, in order to get the actual uh, 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 welding uh, strengths, the stresses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And in this video, I just want to cover some basic uh, introductory things here. Okay. Well, let's see. So a table J two point five. Again, this defines resistance factors. Defines resistance factors, your fees, for various uh, weld types and orientations. 
So for example, if you look at the top there, they say complete penetration, a complete joint penetration groove weld. So basically a full pen welds. And they'll have, uh, for example, here at the, at the, at the very first le uh, uh, line there, they'll say tension normal to the weld axis. And they'll say the strength of the joint is controlled by the base metal. And then uh, required filler metal le uh, strength level, matching filler metal shall be used for T and corner joints with backing left in place. Not tough filler metal is required. See section J2.6. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, coming up. Uh, and so basically, there's just a whole series of requirements based on how you're loading up your welds. Uh, so again, it depends on one, the uh, type of weld, whether fillet, partial pen, full pen, etc. Uh, full pen, partial pen, uh, fillet, etc. And it also depends on the orientation. And when I say orientation, what I'm talking about here is, uh, let's say you have, let's say your weld is like this, and you're applying a load like this. This would be one orientation. This would be transverse or perpendicular to the weld. Or you could have something like this here, where the load is longitudinal with the weld. This is your weld here. You could have a force P applied here. Okay, so we have that. And then on page 16.1-124, uh, we have the continuation of that table and that covers fillet welds. Um, fillet welds here. This is covered in uh, page on page 16.1. Uh, 16.1-124, basically the continuation of that table. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, so you can, we'll, we'll reference that as we go along, uh, well, and we'll come back to that. I'm just providing that as a brief introduction, to, and this is where we're getting our resistance factors. So moving on, I want to look at base metal strength. Base metal strength. Oh, let's see. Um, let me see here about how I want to describe this. Uh, let's see. So base metal strength, the area of the weld, or the weld area, uh, weld area, and I'm here. And notice again I said the, uh, well the base metal, the area of the base metal is going to be based on that, but uh, anyway, but let's look at the weld area, AW as I mentioned previously. The weld area, the, the base, uh, we'll see here, uh, the weld area, um, is the actual area of the weld is going to vary, varies based on the type of weld you use. On the type of weld you use. Uh, for example, well mainly the, the, the same definition is going to be used here though. Um, so basically the weld area is equal to the effective throat times the weld length. Effective throat times the weld uh, length, uh, t times the weld length. Uh, we will discuss that. AW is equal to TE uh, times LW where TE is the effective throat of the weld. The effective throat of the weld. And what this is defined as is the shortest distance uh, the shortest distance from the root of the weld uh, or root of the joint 
uh, root of the joint to the face of the weld. To the face of the weld. And LW is the weld length. And this is a good time that I need to discuss some welding terminology. We have terms like uh, throat and face, and we really need to talk about what these things mean. You only use those terminologies in the lab? Yeah, like if you have a well and you check into the lab with as such, the one that used it, they're going to use that in the shop. Okay, LW is equal to weld length. Okay, so let's consider weld terminology here. Now, um, basically, if you're not familiar with welds, uh, the two main types of welds we're going to be talking about are um, penetration welds and fillet welds. So, what is a penetration weld or a full pen weld in this case? What is it? Pen it completely fuses two, two pieces together. Exactly. A full pen weld would be one that completely, a full penetration weld is going to completely fuse two pieces of metal together. Uh, two pieces of metal together. So for example, say I have a plate here, and I want to fully join it to a plate, another plate um, here. How can I do that? Let's say I have a plate here and another plate here that I wish to join together. Now, the full pen weld, how I would do this is I would simply, well, uh, let's see. First, uh, let's say the plates are more like, uh, more creatively drawn, craftily drawn. So um, now, if this were a bolted connection, if I wanted to connect these two plates together with bolts, I can't do that with just a single, just with just nothing but bolts. I would need to put a plate here and a plate here, or just a single plate, and then bolt them to the bolt each bolt each of them to that plate and hold them together with a series of bolts. Now, with a full pen weld, how I would do this is well, I would still need some sort of I would need to use some sort of like temporary plate or permanent plate here as a backer. Otherwise, my um, Otherwise, my weld material just sort of fall right through the floor here. So what I would do is, though, I would come along here and I would cut the end of each plate before I join them. So we're going to cut the end of each plate. So now each plate looks like this. So I basically cut a, a notch at the end of each plate. And then the weld material, and if you're not familiar with welding, the basic idea, uh, now anyone who actually has a background in welding is going to uh, kill me for oversimplifying here, but the basic idea is to come along here and fill in a gap of metal with molten steel. That's basically what welding is. You're basically creating a tiny bit of molten steel and depositing it on the surface of this, and, when it fe and then when it cools, it actually remains bonded together. So with bolts, you're not actually literally bonding materials together. You just have one thing uh, connected snugly to another thing that's connected snugly to another thing. When you weld, you're actually taking two pieces of metal and turning them into one. You are fusing them together at the molecular level. That is what welding fundamentally is. Um, so with a full pen weld, you are going to have the weld material go all the way through um, from the top to the bottom of a uh, plate. And that, that's the basic idea of a full pen weld. And so now I drew this with a little bit of uh, extrusion at the top. You could come back and grind this flat if you wanted to. Um, but anyway, that's the basic idea of the uh, of a full pen weld. You're basically literally fusing two different things together. Uh huh? <coughs> what kind of fillet? What kind of material can you use? Uh, now, if you look, we will discuss that. But if you look on table, uh, you're getting a bit ahead of here, but that's fine. If you look on 16.1-125. Uh, section uh, 2.6, there is a, there are a whole series, uh, there's a whole table there on filler metal requirements. So for example, if you have A36 less than three quarter inch thick, you have to use a matching filler material of 60 or, and 70 KSI 
uh, weld material. So basically, depending, you can't just use any steel. Like you can't just, you know, uh, weld material is a very uh, delicate process. You can't just, you know, grab some random 836 plate, melt, melt it down in a furnace in your garage and say, oh, I now have weld material. No, that doesn't work so well. Um, so uh, you can, uh, the, the weld filaments, they, they are produced in very thin wires and rods. And basically they are, uh, the idea is you select a filler material that is compatible with whatever plate or steel, or whatever material, A36, A992, whatever your uh, object that you're welding is made of. And, and that's how you, you match together, basically. Okay? Uh, so that's a full pen weld. And a partial pen weld is just like this, except you're not filling it all the way to the top. A partial penetration weld. Or more often, probably not that you're not filling it all the way to the top. More likely, it's just that you're not making your notch all the way down. Would be something like this here. That looks really bad. So say you have your one plate here. I'm only cutting a bit out of the whole out of the thing, not the entire, uh, not all the way through. Maybe something like this. And then your weld material ends up filling this little gap there. Now, the nice thing about a full pen weld is that it does result in the, uh, really the strongest strength available because uh, you are completely mobilizing the entire cross section of that plate. And it is a very, uh, it does produce a very strong joint. However, uh, full pen welds do produce some difficulties. So, uh, you know, there are some cases where, especially novice engineers or, or just lazy engineers, will uh, sometimes say, uh, oh, this full pen welds around the entire section. <laughs> uh, but if you try to think about the actual requirements of that, um, doing that via building is incredibly difficult. So uh, the difficulties of full pen welding, even though, yes, this is uh, materially optimal. <laughs> uh, difficulties of full pen welding. The difficulties of that, well, think about this. Imagine if I have a W section, and I say I want you to fold pen weld around the entire thing. That's going to be quite difficult. That's going to be quite difficult. So basically, we're going to be cutting notches in the end. Oh, that's a really bad flange. Uh, we're going to be cutting notches in the uh, top, edge, bottom sides. So you're going to have this thing hanging in the air, and somebody's going to be cutting a notch in this part here, actually drilling all the way, th cutting all the way through the flange, all the way through this flange, all the way through the web, and then they're going to need ba they're going to need backer plates here. They're going to need backer plates here. They're going to need um, some sort of uh, some sort of plate here to keep things from dripping down. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. It can be done, but yes. Um, for built up sections, do they typically use pen full penetration welds? Uh, built up sections sometimes you use full pen, some or more typically you'll use fillet. It just depends on what your exact application is. So uh, we will. The next thing we're going to talk about is fillet welds. Um, so. Now, full pen welds, the advantage of these is that they are easier to design because often you can just say, oh, well, um, I'm just going to take the full pen weld and the, full, the, the weld material is always going to be generally a little bit stronger than the base material. So, yeah, if you prescribe a full pen weld, your design as a structural uh, engineer calculating things is relatively simple. You just say, oh, use a full pen weld. But actually doing that, actually building that, actually making that constructible is something that's a lot more difficult. So. Um, but then let's look at the next idea of, uh, so again, partial pen welds are those that where the weld does not go all the way through. It's still a fillet weld, but our little notch doesn't go all the way through the entire width of the plate or the entire thickness of the plate. And the other main type of weld we want to think about is fillet welds. Uh, fillet welds are probably more common, yes. They're a lot easier to you to construct. A lot e it's, it's a lot easier for a welder um, to put together a fillet weld than it is for them to put together a uh, than it is for them to put together a full pen weld. So with a fillet weld, we're going to take two plates. And so the problem with fillet welds is, remember here, 
if you're cutting all the way through this, you're putting in molten iron, you're putting in molten steel. And so you're gonna need some sort of backer plate just to keep that molten steel from dripping all the way through. You need to have something just to keep the steel from dripping through. Otherwise it's gonna fall down and land on somebody's head and you're gonna have a very bad day and a very angry person who you drop molten steel on. But uh, steel toed boots required, great. Anyway, um, fillet welds are maybe a little bit more difficult to design. Not really that difficult to design, but still more difficult than just saying, oh, we'll just use full pen welds. Uh, with fillet welds, um, the basic idea is like this. You have uh, one plate joined to another plate. And what you're going to do is you're gonna come along here and you're going to put in a fillet. Now, if you remember your terminology from, uh, say, drafting or design class, things like that, engineering drafting, uh, what is a fillet? Or if you remember this from uh, our earlier discussions of sectional properties, what is a fillet? It, it is not a fillet. No, it's, that's not a steak. Maybe you're hungry, but it's not a steak. Oh, boy. A uh, fillet is a small uh, circular or a small, uh, a small uh, triangular joint, uh, basically something that... Traditionally, if I think of a fillet, I think of something round, where you have something like, like this. It's like a radius, basically, like an inner radius. Well, it's a rounded inside corner. It's a rounded inside corner, essentially, yes. And a fillet weld, now, it's normally triangular rather than round, but we can still, it's, when you actually end up producing the weld, it ends up being a little bit more round than, than triangular. But uh, I consider it, uh, in terms of design, we're gonna be looking at a triangle. And basically what you're doing is you're coming along and putting a little bit, of, you're just putting a bit of weld here. Now, I'm, I drew that as a, bit, a lot bigger than it usually is. Uh, more accurately, it's usually something like this. If I come along and show this here, maybe make these plates a little bit thicker. Here and here. The weld would be like this. Like this. So you could have a weld that goes all the way up to the top, but more typically, you will have one that goes just partial, uh, partially up the plate, depending on what kind of loads are required. Depending on what kind of loads are required. Okay. All right, uh, any questions on that basic uh, definition of welds? So those are our basic weld types, but in turn, I then need to, dis I then need to define um, uh, some terminology, including I want to talk about the root of the weld, the face of the weld, the throat of the weld, and the length of the weld. So, lovely. Welding terminology. Welding terminology. And I'm going to describe both of these for the, uh, for all of this, for, sorry, for both uh, full pen and for uh, fillet welds, for fillet welds, lovely. So uh, let's see, uh, first I'll do the case of the, let's first do the case of the full pen weld. And I'm gonna draw this nice and big so I can give myself some room to work here. So let's say I have one plate here, another plate here, and then the weld material is joining them together in a full pen weld. So let's label some uh, locations here and dimensions. Uh, I would refer to this as the root of the weld. The root of the weld, I would refer to this as the face of the weld. And I would refer to this line here as the throat of the weld. This is the throat of the weld, or a weld throat, 
And the important thing about the throat of the weld is that this is your failure plane. This is your failure plane. So we've learned this before when we looked at tension members and we looked at, uh, say, uh, block shear rupture and things like that. Failures tend to happen along, uh, when, when in, at least in a, in a material of given strength, in a section of given strength, uh, failure tends to happen along the minimal distance. So if this thing is going to tear apart, it's going to look for the minimum length it can, the line with minimum length, in order to tear through that. Now, when we check the strength of this, we'll look at both the, uh, we will look at both the strength of the base metal, which would be like a line here, but we would also look at the strength of the weld. But the question is, what? How do we calculate that area? We calculate the area based on the throat of the weld because look at this. If it wants to tear out along this line here. If it's going to tear out along this line here, that length is going to be longer than this length here. Uh, failure is always going to go for the, the chain is always broken and that's the weakest link. And failure always occurs generally along the minimum surface area, uh, assuming equal strength. Like basically like this line here, for example, has the same uh, stress limit as this line here because they're the same material. So uh, as long as they have the same material, the same stress, et cetera, this the failure line is always going to be along the line of uh, shortest length. And so that is what's important about the, the weld throat. The weld throat, because it's the shortest distance, this for welds is typically going to be your failure point. This will be the failure uh, line or failure plane slash line for the weld itself. Now, this does not mean uh, that this is going to be the, fail, uh, the failure plane for the entire connection. So for example, remember how I mentioned that we need to, take, we need to check both the base metal strength and the weld strength? Well, uh, and the reason for that is oftentimes the weld material is stronger than the base metal. So if, our, uh, if this is 70 KSI material and this is 50 KSI material, well, uh, even if this is filled all the way up to the top, it's high, highly probable that instead of the weld failing, the, uh, the weld is actually stronger than the material it's bounding to. So instead of failing anywhere in the weld, the plate itself will just be pulled apart in tension or something like that, or yielding or, or rupture, I should say, probably. And so, uh, but if we're talking specifically about a failure that occurs within the weld material itself, if you're ever going to have a failure within the weld material itself, the failure plane is going to be within the throat. And, uh, but then, uh, the length of the weld, well, this is fairly simple. I, it's not, I'm not going to be able to show it on this drawing, but if I were to draw the, uh, if I were to draw maybe the two plates here, something like that, and then something like that, I'm looking at this uh, from above, and let's say there was the weld here. <coughs> this is the weld and not to scale, of course. I mean, this is not to scale. Normally, these would be several inches long and a fraction of an inch thick, so this is definitely not to scale. But this would be your LW here. Basically, it is the length into the page here. So the dimension into the page, uh, how long this thing projects along a line, that is the length of your weld. And so basically, oh, that's welding term that is welding terminology for full pen welds. Uh, let's see here. Welding terminology for full pin welds. Let's see. Yep. Uh, and I seem to be having a little technical difficulties. Hmm, lovely. PowerPoint seems to have crashed. Lovely. Let's see here. Sorry about this. I hate technical difficulties. Great. Uh, those seem to have disappeared. Okay. Um, well, it's still recording, so um, I'll keep going along here. Uh, well, I want to next look at weld terminology for uh, weld terminology 
for uh, uh, fillet welds. Uh, fillet welds. Well, terminology for fillet welds. Uh, so if you have the two plates here and here, and then you have some fillet here. So you have some fillet here and a plate here and a plate here. Uh, but then let me draw this a lot bigger. Just enough, just so I can have some nice dimensions here. Then I have a fillet like this. Well, this down here would still be the throat of the weld, or sorry, the root of the weld. This would be the root of the weld. This would be the face of the weld. And this distance here would be the throat of the weld. The throat of the weld. That there would be the throat of the weld. That would be the throat of the weld. Uh, so we have that now, root of weld and throat of the weld. Root of the weld and throat of the weld. And of course, the length of the weld. Uh, the length of the weld would again be extending into page. Uh, extends into page. Okay. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and the length of the weld is going to extend into the page. Okay. Uh, next, I, huh? Uh, oh, sorry, into the board here, into my page. The length of the weld would extend into the page. It's a three-dimensional type system. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, but good question. Uh, next, I'd like to discuss uh, matching weld material. Typically, and, and this is going to be table, uh, uh, that's going to be uh, on uh, section 3, uh, 2.6, J2.6. So what I want to look at is uh, basically, and I want to discuss some of the sort of philosophy here in chemistry as well. So uh, matching weld material. This is very critical. All right, and why is this important? So matching weld material. Well, as we learned at the start of the semester, uh, steel's property, steel pro uh, the properties of steel depend on what? What does it fundamentally come down to? What does it come down to? What do the properties of steel depend on? Uh, what it will, yes, not, not in term, what, what are the mechanical, what are the material properties, like what determines the yield stress of a given piece of steel? The composition, yes, exactly. Ultimately, steel's proper, steel properties, or the properties of steel, come down to chemistry. Uh, ultimately, the properties of steel come down to chemistry. Uh, come down to chemistry. And so, uh, when you are designing, a, when you are welding things, now, uh, when you're bolting something, uh, you're, the, the chemistry doesn't really have to be that compatible. Um, because you're not actually relying on things to become chemically bonded. Uh, things don't become chemically bonded. Thing, nothing ends up chemically bonded. So you can really use any steel with any steel, and it's going to be fine, within reasonable limits. Uh, so chemistry is not as important. Uh, so chemistry is not as important. Now, obviously, now I could think of really weird cases, like if you were insane, you could uh, try to, you could actually have chemical problems with bolts. Like, for example, if you tried to, uh, 
I don't know, um, if you used radically different metals, like if you used bolts that weren't even made out of steel or something like that, if you tried to use aluminum bolts or something and, uh, crazy like that, well, then you might have some problems. But uh, as long as you're using steel bolts with steel, uh, you're not going to have any kind. I'm, I'm thinking like if you used radically different materials with, you know, different, uh, you know, voltage potentials or something like that, uh, you know, thinking back to uh, thinking back to chemistry class and such. Um, if you try to do that, sure, then you can end up with r uh, rapid corrosion or something really insane like that. You'd basically, if you put it radically different bolts, like bolts not, not even made out of steel, try to join two steel sections together, you'd basically be turning your connection into a voltaic cell and you'd have all sorts of lovely corrosion. Um, but generally we don't need to worry about that because we're not completely insane. But when we're bolting things together, chemistry, matching chemistries really aren't really important. All that matters is really just strength. But with welding, chemistry matters. Welding, it, I, I cannot stress enough that with welding, chemistry matters. Chemistry absolutely matters uh, because things become chemically bonded together. Things are going to become chemically bonded together. You are literally taking a bit of molten metal, connecting it to another bit. Uh, you're connecting. You're taking a bit of uh, two existing bits of metal and joining them together with another bit of molten metal. And so the only way that whole and uh, the only way that works is if things end up uh, bonded together. I mean, think about this. Have you ever thought about how weird welding is? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, imagine if you were to try to do that with concrete. How would that work? Let's say I wanted to join one a concrete. Let's say I wanted to join a concrete beam to a concrete column. What if I tried to weld the concrete? What would, the, what would be the, chem, the concrete equivalent of welding? The concrete equivalent of welding would be to mix up some mortar and stick my beam up against the column and sort of slather on a bunch of mortar and hope that holds. Would that work? No, that wouldn't work because, and why not? Like, well, the reason that wouldn't work is because chemistry. The chemistry of the reaction of, of concrete, of the reaction of the, uh, of the uh, cement paste, just does not allow for that type of bond. It just doesn't allow for that uh, because of the chemistry. And, and so now if, you're, if you want to come along later and form a connection to concrete, you need to use more mechanical bonds. You need to use things like development length and you need to extend steel rebar from one member into another, as we discussed previously. And so, um, as we discussed back when we looked at development length. And so uh, with concrete, you can't get that kind of chemical bond. But with steel, you can. You can use welding. And welding, again, comes down to chemistry. So it is exceptionally important to use compatible material. And so now, um, the code doesn't require you to know a lot about welding chemistry. Uh, code doesn't require you to know about welding chemistry. Well, actually, let me just provide a summary of why this is important. Why is, why, why is it important? Uh, why are compatible metals material uh, important? Uh, compatible weld metals important. Well, a few reasons. One, uh, to ensure a strong and compatible bond. This is your chemistry. This is your chemistry. Uh, two, uh, another major thing is to provide similar levels of mechanical properties. Things like similar ductility, uh, ductility, thermal expansion, etc. So for example, and also a uh, similar uh, yield, or sorry, similar um, E, modulus elasticity. Now, normally you consider all steels to have a modulus elasticity of 29,000, but truth be told, there are gonna be some slight variations in that. But still, you want to make sure that your weld material has a very similar modulus elasticity to your base material. Otherwise, when this thing bends, if you have a, if you have a weld sitting on top of a beam, 
if you have a bit of weld sitting on top of the flange of a beam, when this thing bends, if they're not compatible, say you have a bit of weld sitting on top of the flange of a beam. When this thing bends, if this thing goes into bending, you want to make sure that this thing is going to bend along with this one. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. They're going to want to bend at different rates. That's going to produce stress in your weld and maybe even cause your weld to fail. If you had radically different modulus elasticity or something like that, and radically different, well, um, when I say radically different, uh, uh, when I say radically different, uh, now obviously yes, they're all going to be pretty close to 29,000, but uh, even slight differences could cause problems if they are because of the small size of welds. Okay, now you don't need to worry about all of this. You don't. They don't require the code does not require you to have a masterful knowledge of chemistry. Instead, they per they solve all of these issues through a table of compatible filler materials. So all of these issues, all of these issues are resolved by using compatible materials. Uh, well, uh, in terms of temperature, the question, uh, the question is, do you need a certain um, environment for welding to set? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, actually, the, now it's not, as, it's not as susceptible to environment as concrete. Now, yes, you want to make sure it's not raining literally on the top of your weld as you're doing it. Huh? Or windy, yes. So, because otherwise, the, the real danger of that is that it'll froth up the weld or you'll have bits of molten metal go flying across the construction site. Or you'll get bubbles in there. So, yeah, actually, environment is a critical factor that you are limited in what you can do. Um, and so, uh, and what else? And other, other environmental things. Uh, well, actually, a major thing that you have to do in welding. And so, uh, I cannot even begin to teach you uh, what you would need to do in this class to actually weld something, to actually do structural quality welds. There's a reason iron workers make very good money, or there's a reason skilled welders make very good money. It's a, it is a, to be a high skilled welder, you, you, you usually requires, uh, you know, a year or two in technical uh, college. It's a, it is a very much a skilled trade. It requires a great deal of experience. Uh, a, you know, I can describe to you, I can teach to you the very basics of well design. But you know, if you hand me a welder and ask, actually ask me to create a high, a high quality structural weld, I won't be able to do that because I am not a skilled iron worker. I haven't studied that. I haven't studied and or practiced with the methods to do that. Uh, to actually do that requires quite a bit of skill. So um, it is a, it is very much the definition of a skilled trade. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, and all, all also one of the major things in terms of environment, uh, it's not actually necessarily even the environmental temperature but the temperature of the base metal. So uh, if you take, uh, if you take ho uh, white hot molten metal and put it on co a cool underplate, you get rapid thermal expansion and stressing and stress cracks and things like that. So often what you'll do is they will actually come along with a torch and preheat the base material. So the, they won't heat it to the point of being, be, it being molten, but they'll heat the base metal before they even put any uh, joining metal on there. They will heat that up to the point of being red hot and then they'll apply the uh, the, ba the weldering material because otherwise what's going to happen is um, when that thing cools, uh, it will uh, you'll end up with uh, different. You want to basically you want everything to cool and shrink together. Otherwise, you get one thing co things cooling at different rates. You get stresses pr basically pre built up stresses in the weld that causes issues. So, and uh, in terms of when you need that, now you don't always need that. Sometimes you need to preheat. Sometimes you don't. And uh, as far as when you need that, well. Uh, that's why you need to go to welding school. So it's a it is a, a very skilled trade. Exactly. Yeah. So all of these issues are resolved by using compatible weld materials. Uh, weld slash filler materials. <laughs> Compatible weld slash filler materials. And so this is laid out in section, in a table in section, uh, table in section um, J2.6, which is on page 16.1-125 of the AISC, AISC 15th edition. And although I might reproduce it here just for a, uh, just for an illustration of how this works. So if you have, for example, um, base metal, 
uh, base metal. And matching filler. Base metal and matching filler. Well, for example, uh, let's go down the line here. If you have A36, relatively thin or just thin A36 plate, uh, if you have A36 less than 3 quarter inch thick, Uh, less than three quarter inch thick. Uh, you can use 70 and 80 KSI and 80 or 70, 60 and 70 KSI filler. So notice we're typically using weld material that is stronger than the base material. Uh, then if you have then you have a whole bunch of series here, including now I won't list all of the steels here, but including A36. There are some others in this slot here, but I'm just going to brush over them briefly. A36 greater than 3 quarter inch. Uh, we also have our A572, uh, A572 grade 50 and 55, and 55. And uh, we also have our A992, some of the ones we use a lot in this class. A992. And the matching filler for these would be SMAW, uh, E705, or E7015, E7015 if I can talk properly, E7, uh, E7016, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then for others, oh, sorry, this is for uh, solid metal arc welding, uh, SMAW. We'll talk about more about weld processes in a bit. Uh, other processes, Uh, used as a 70 KSI filler. And then for others, we have uh, we have a few other higher ones as well. Okay, so the whole idea is that you need to just go, whatever material you have, you need to then go and check to make sure that you have the right, uh, that you have the right uh, matching filler material. Now, uh, there is one question that arises here. Um, so if we're designing our weld material based on the base metal, what happens if I'm joining a 36 KSI plate, uh, let's say I'm joining a half inch thick 36 KSI plate to an A572 plate. What weld material do I use? The strongest one. Essentially, yes, the strongest one. If you look below there, they say, uh, notes, in joints with base metal of different strengths, either a filler metal that matches the higher strength base metal or a filler metal that matches the lower strength and, pro and produces a low hydrogen deposit may be used when matching strength is required. So I would just go ahead and use the higher strength material generally. You can worry about the hydrogen note that later, um, but I would just say um, in general, if you're joining, when joining uh, in general, when joining uh, metals of different strengths uh, or different types, of different types, use the higher prescribed uh, use the uh, prescribed base material of higher strength. Of higher strength. The, uh, the, ba the prescribed base material of higher strength. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. So we have that, we have that here. And I think that will do it for this portion of the lecture. All right, that'll do it for here. Thank you for watching, and as always, thank you.